wake up. You must wake. That's when it stopped. Those were the last words the tall, dark figures spoke to me when a white curtain fell over all that I saw, covering the previous scenery with an endless sea of snow. My pupils slowly started to open, only to see the full moon's reflecting light upon my pale face. I started to shiver. The ground felt cold against my back. My head ached terribly and my hands were all covered in blood and mud. I freaked out. I couldn't remember anything. And how the hell did I end up in a forest? My heart started to pound like a big bass drum, but to my surprise, the anxious beating pattern didn't last long. It's funny that even though I can't remember my own name, I could still recall my chicken-hearted disposition. Darkness can be really terrifying, especially when you're alone, or in a forest, or in a forest all by yourself where the pine trees stretch out as if they were trying to talk to the ricochet of stars in the sky. Finding myself all alone, I decided to find the nearest road out of this hell, but for a moment, I was unsure whether this was truly hell or not, because normally... Under these circumstances, I'd be scared to death, but strangely enough, I somehow felt to be in the right place. Darkness seemed natural, vaguely familiar. Following my intuition, I went straight ahead after walking for about half an hour. I noticed just how silent it was. You'd expect a symphony of gruesome noises and yet you could hear the sound of a needle falling to the ground from miles away. This proved just how much your mind plays tricks on you. After several more hours of walking, I could distinguish a huge mansion not far away from me. I was bound to find help over there, so I started to run towards my salvation. But something seemed awfully wrong. Time quickly passed by no matter how fast I ran. The mansion seemed to be shrinking in front of me. It was like a hollow apparition, disappearing whenever I got near. My feet started to give in from exhaustion, and soon, I would find myself laying on the ground again with the image of the mansion slowly fading away. When I regained consciousness, the feeling I felt on my back was too hard to be the ground I previously felt when waking up. This time it was wood. I realized that I was standing on the wooden porch of the mansion. How did I get here? Things didn't make sense anymore. I wanted to knock on the huge gothic door when I saw my bruised hand. It was still covered in blood. My appearance would raise suspicion, but luckily for me, the nearby lake solved this problem as I washed my hands in the ice-cold water. I was already on my way back to the mansion when I took a last glance at the moon-dogged lake. The view was hauntingly beautiful. Every aspect of it. The mist that flew over the silent water, the blurred reflection of the moon, and the odd shapes of the trees alongside the lake. At the same time, the hollow silence gave it an eerie, bone-chilling feeling. Everything was painted in winter-cloaked background. I felt like a lone wolf, lost in a different world, but nothing but my solitude to keep me company. Finally, I decided to leave my transcendental state of mind, so I turned back and went to the house. My heart started to beat heavily again. I could hear every beat loud and clear. There I was now, standing in the front of the door, curiously eavesdropping. I waited to hear something, but the only sound audible was the howl of the wind. This made me feel very uneasy. Trembling, I shrugged and lifted my arm ready to knock the door, when it slowly opened by itself. The house seemed to be calling for me. Hello? Is anybody here? I said with a shaky voice. The moment I stepped inside... I figured the house must have been abandoned, 
Judging by its huge windows and old-fashioned architecture, I'd say the house dated back from the 20s. The more I stayed in the room, the more it creeped me out. To my right, I could barely distinguish a spiderweb-filled fireplace, and to my left, the purple draperies were open, thus allowing the moon to cover half the room in bright light and leaving the other half pitch black. I saw a rusty metallic door at the end of the chamber, and whilst going to the door, I couldn't help but to feel as if I was being watched by someone from the dark side of the room. It took ages to get to, and my heart started to race as I reached for the door handle. The unusually cold sensation I felt when touching it sent shivers down my spine. I had to put a lot of strength in opening the creaking door, and the sounds it made were echoing throughout the house. I slowly entered the room. It was a lot smaller than the parlor. In front of me was a desk with only one drawer, and on top of that, a mirror was hanging on the wall. To my right side was another door. I saw my reflection in the mirror when reaching for the drawer. My god, I said in my mind. Numerous scratches covered my face and neck as if someone had scratched, maimed, and mauled me. Terrified by my own appearance, I stopped staring at the mirror and opened the drawer. A small black and white photograph was all that I found. I picked it up and squeaked my eyes to be able to make anything out in the dim light. It was a family portrait. They were all dressed in old Victorian clothes. I looked at every family member in part and could tell that their faces appeared to be somewhat happy. The loving mother. The hard-working dad. The elder son. The daughter. And that's when I dropped the photograph back in the drawer. My whole body was shaking terribly. I was frozen with fear at the image of the little girl in the picture. Her face was completely blank. I didn't feel safe, so I turned around and closed the door. Now, are you by any chance familiar with that particular feeling? The feeling when you're so afraid of something you just close your eyes. But at the same time, curiosity gets the best of you. So you open them up again, knowing damn well you'll regret it afterwards. Well, that's the way I felt. I picked the photograph up to take a closer look when I saw the little girl in the mirror. She was standing right behind me, but this time her face wasn't blank. It was the most disturbing appearance I had ever seen. Her elongated face was moving slowly from one side to another. Her jaw literally hung open and her eyes looked like two huge lumps of coal, devoid of pity. Her scalp was covered with the longest, greasiest black hair I'd ever seen. She seemed to be wearing a small, dirty nightgown, which only exposed her pale, bluish-skinned limbs. I started to scream, but that didn't last long because her stench reached for my nostrils and made me puke a little in my mouth. She was staring right at me through the mirror. Uh, I tried to run, but my legs were anchored to the ground. Her stick legs began to move. God, the way she moved her body with those scarred arms, which reached back against the wall, her hair falling out and the rotten flesh drained every bit of sanity I had left. I remember the door to my right, so in an excess of adrenaline, I managed to run like hell towards it. This time, I opened it with no problems. The next room looked exactly the same like the previous one one desk, and one mirror. Looking in the mirror, I saw the little girl all crawled up behind me, and unlike the ghost stories I've heard in my childhood, this one was running with anger and rage towards me. With my heart this time thumping insanely fast, I reached out to the door and entered another room. Same story, one desk and one mirror. But I couldn't stop to think about this peculiar occurrence. Each time I looked in the mirror, I saw her crawling with her face pointed straight at me and with her fingers getting closer and closer to my legs. I couldn't take it anymore. 
The reflection of her face in the mirror corrupted my mind to succumb into madness, and in a moment of frenzy, I jumped out the window. To my disappointment, I was still alive. I couldn't bear to see her any longer. But yet, there she was, standing motionless in the window pane, staring straight at me with boiling rage. From this distance, she looked exactly like the photograph, all painted white. I just wanted to lay down and pass away as quickly as possible, but then she jumped. The sounds her body made when she crashed to the ground were horrifying. She slowly got up and assumed her dreadful stance. Each step the small child took reminded me of the hell that awaited me. Is this a dream? It must be a dream. This insanity goes beyond my grasp of reality. While pondering the reasons for this happening, she finally got to me. Seeing her stand beside me, hearing her breathe, and smelling her scent of death quickly reminded me of how real she was. I screamed my lungs out, but she wouldn't react. Why hasn't she killed me already? What was she waiting for? I stopped my screaming and shaking. Life wouldn't be worth living anymore, not after witnessing these horrors. My brain has been scarred for life and I reckon this was my time to depart. Then she bent down, with her face right now in front of mine. I closed my eyes for one last time. It's okay, son. We forgive you. Just come back to us. That voice. I recognize that voice. It's my father's. I slowly opened my pupils, and although my vision was blurry, I could still recognize them. My caring, hard-working father and my beautiful mother. Why, they were sobbing. Their eyes bloodshot red from all the tears spilled on the blanket of my bed. Where am I? This isn't my room. The machines beeping next to me clearly didn't belong to me. Why is my arm tied to the bed with handcuffs? Panicking, I started to weep and bawl through my oxygen mask. It didn't take long for me to receive an explanation. Pop took out a newspaper from Mom's handbag, and the flashy headline on the main page made me go numb. Young girl killed in car accident. Hit and run. Drunken teenager crashes into tree. I hear a knock. A dark figure slowly opened the door and entered the room. My eyes, still wet, couldn't distinguish his distorted face, but somehow there was a constant smile on it. I looked at my parents, but they still didn't seem to notice his presence at all. He's now at the other side of my bed, parallel with my parents, but still no reaction from them. His face, his lack of face. It was impossible not to recognize human traits from this range. Same old distorted face with a huge smile on it. He averted his face from my parents to me and slowly started to whisper. Finally, you're up. Are you ready? He grabbed my arm, his smile widened, and asked me again. Are you ready? And I closed my eyes. This next one is called The Tunnel Run, written by Jacob Newell. It was 9.30pm on a Sunday night, and I had only just left for work. There was a mountain of paperwork sat at my desk that had to be completed for Monday morning, but I knew it couldn't be done. I'd already given up my entire weekend, so it was difficult to find the energy to worry. I'd grown bored of my job now anyway, so I didn't really care what my boss said, I just needed a beer. I wandered out of the office doors, through the car park, and made my way down to the darkened road. Then, like that, I was free. I was 21 now and I had reached the age when I believed I knew everything. I'd long grown used to living on my own and doing what I pleased, so I assumed I'd eventually just find a new job and be fine. 
My only regret that night was making the walk home. Seeing as there is only two ways to reach my flat, and one of them is a longer trek than the other, I could see no reason for taking the scenic route, so I set off along my usual path. The journey home usually consisted of trudging down a miserable, lifeless road in which various holes had seemed to swallow up parts of the ground. And it was the same old walk for a little while. Well, until I noticed the cutoff. It was a street that I had clearly passed every day on my way home. But I had only just noticed now. Feeling slightly confused, I decided to wander over to take a better look and hopefully refresh my mind. Smith's Avenue, it was called, with it being a small, homely street. I expected it to be somewhat pleasant, but it wasn't. It was surrounded by rotting monoliths and huge trees, making it look centuries old. At the very bottom, there was an abandoned ice cream truck that had been absorbed by the plants, while next to it was a pitch black tunnel. There was no light coming from anywhere in the street, but a silver glow from the moon to guide my eyes. I didn't feel scared, nor did I feel the need to run away, but the street seemed very familiar, and that made me feel slightly uneasy. I was about to turn and get back to walking home when I realized how I knew this street. Eight years ago, I had a friend named Eddie Bursko. We used to play in the same street that I was now looking at, but it looked a lot different when I was a child. Back then I lived with my mom and dad, a happy life as I recall, but I lost them at a young age and seemed to block out a lot of memories. Maybe that's why I forgot about Eddie in the street. I wasn't sure, but I knew that I had to go and take a look around. Straight away, my mind was flooded with memories mostly of looking out the window and seeing Eddie playing out there. I remember kicking a football around all day, eating ice cream in the summer, riding our bikes in the sun with no worries at all. But my strongest memories were that of the tunnel. Even back then, in the light of my mind, the tunnel was just as dark as it looked to me now. So with our childish minds, we took the opportunity to create a game. The tunnel run, we called it. The game was simple. We each took turns to run down the tunnel to see who could make it the farthest without getting scared and turning back. There was one catch though. Neither of us knew how far it went. If I remember rightly, neither of us ever made it all the way to the other end. Not long after I lost my parents, I was placed with a foster family and I never saw Eddie ever again. Judging by the condition of the street now, it's safe to say that he doesn't live here anymore. I made my way to the tunnel at the far end of the street and stood at the edge of darkness. I felt the urge to try the tunnel run, for all time's sake. I took my phone out and dimly lit a foot or so in front of me as I made my way inside. I walked this time. There was nothing but silence with me in that tunnel, and I think that's what compelled me to keep moving forward. I carried on walking until I got so far inside, I couldn't see anything at either end. But I wasn't scared. It seemed peaceful. After walking for what seemed like 20 minutes or so, I was stopped in my tracks when I could see a dim red light at the far end of the tunnel. I had to reach it. Was this the end that I had never reached? that Eddie had never reached. I had to find out. I kept on walking and walking until the light slowly came into focus and looked a lot brighter. At this point, I could make out something standing next to it, shuffling about and breathing. Then the smell of smoke hit me and my body tightened. I stopped walking. I then began to step backwards so that I could leave, so I could make a run for it. When out of nowhere... I heard someone mumble, beat you to it. It was Eddie. It had to be him. I could just tell. I moved towards him and couldn't believe my eyes. It was definitely him, but he looked different. 
Not just older, but scarier. His features seemed twisted, and a wry smile sat upon his face. He was stood next to a huge metal door, almost like a bouncer at a nightclub. He stared for a moment, winked at me and muttered, Come inside. I needed to talk to him, and he clearly needed to talk to me too, so I followed him through the metal door. My stomach was turning, this all seemed like a dream. Once I was inside, my vision blurred for a moment. When it came back into focus, I was sure that my eyes were deceiving me. We were in my bedroom from when I was a young boy. It wasn't a place made to seem like my old room. It was my exact room. The smell, the warmth, the memories all filled my being. I smiled, and that's when Eddie turned to look at me. Do you remember what your childhood was like? Though confused, I replied, Well, I remember some of it. It was... good. Was it? From what I can remember, it really was. Playing in the summer, ice cream, football. So, you remember everything being fine, do you? Everything was... perfect. Eddie snarled. What do you mean? I remember what I remember. It wasn't all good, no. I remember my parents dying and uh, me going to a foster home. Never seeing you again, you just disappeared. Before all that, though, I had a great childhood. My teenage years were great, too. Even my foster family were nice people. Did you forget what your mom and dad were like? They were fiends. Disgusting people. They used to beat you up and down, kick you, punch you. They used to put cigarettes out in your arm. Did you forget all of that? And I realized that I had... I had completely forgotten. Everything came back to me at that point, all at once like a huge wave. All of the pain that my parents had put me through emerged from the darkness, and I knew then exactly why I blocked out my childhood. How did they die? Eddie said, and I mumbled, I, I can't remember. What do you remember? Here take a look at this. It may look familiar. My old bedroom suddenly changed, and I was in another bedroom. I could tell that it was in the same house, but it was completely charred, burnt to a crisp. I remembered that bedroom. It was very familiar, but for some reason, I didn't know why. That's my bedroom, Eddie said. I remember one night after we had taken our usual beatings, you came into my room and whispered to me that we needed to do something. We needed to get out of here. A moment before you left, you threw a box of matches on my bed and told me to set fire to my bedroom. You said that we could make it look like an accident. I was young and naive, so I agreed to it. You told me that if I did it correctly... We could leave and be happy with another family. But you left me. You ran out of my house and left me screaming in my bedroom. The fire spread so fast, I didn't know what to do. I just called out my brother's name, but nobody came. You didn't just leave our parents to die in that fire. You left me. I could see the pain and sadness in his eyes as he told me the whole story. My little brother didn't seem so scary anymore. I placed my head in his hands and cried more than ever. I just couldn't believe it. I remembered everything. My abusive parents, my younger brother. The only good part of my childhood all dead. Because of me. I blocked everything out from my younger life but kept a hold of the good memories. I got a new family, inherited every penny from my old life and changed my name to start fresh, nobody knowing what I had done. The authorities called it an accident. I lifted my head up with tears streaming down my face to apologize. 
but he was already gone. And at that moment, I wanted to die. I tried to bury my past to move on, but it didn't work. It was bound to find me sooner or later. I didn't deserve to start a new life, and Eddie would never get to. I looked around at the empty room to see if he was anywhere to be seen. But he wasn't. It was just me and my tears. I stepped forward and opened the huge metal door. Then, with a rush of light, I was back at the top of Smith's Avenue. I glanced down at the street, and it looked exactly the same as it did back in my childhood. Except for one house at the end which was completely burnt. I turned away and left that street, and I don't think I'll ever go back there again. But I remember everything now, and I'll never forgive myself. I just wish I could speak to my baby brother again. This one is called The Flesh Market. Have you ever visited Edinburgh? Beautiful city. No matter what time of year you go, the castle that sits at the center of the city is awe-inspiring, looking down on the surrounding area from the mount. The peaks and valleys of the land have resulted in a city that flows with the landscape. Streets that surround can be steep, with the numerous sprawling alleyways even steeper. It is here that we find the flesh market. It could be mistaken for any other darkened causeway in the city. It sits among the shops and tourist traps, relatively non-threatening, and can be used as a shortcut to get down to the station if you're in a hurry. The name has been justified, through some who point out that flesh markets are local term for butchers, and through others who suggested a hangout of women of the first vocation. These are incorrect. There's a market on the clothes, but flesh is not the product. It is the currency. Market hours are dusk until dawn, and the entrance fee is one mouthful of your own blood. Prepare a glass and progress down the alley. As you get halfway down, swig from the glass and spit it against the wall. The blood will bubble and spread across the wall, coagulating into a hardened scab. This will then start to flake and scatter. A rather anticlimactic door will be revealed beneath. Stepping through is disorienting as logic will tell you you are stepping into a building. The space you are stepping into has no walls, with darkness shrouding the edges. It is at the penumbra that a number of stalls are set up, run by individuals who look like market traders from across the globe. From Arabian merchant to Cockney grocers to New York street con men, all of their clothes are splattered with blood and offal. These figures will entice you to come speak with them and will gesture to numerous signs around their stalls regarding the sales they are currently having. Upon approaching one of the stalls, they will start to pressure you to make a deal with them. You are certainly welcome to do so, and the products that are available are certainly worth consideration. Starting at the cheap end of the spectrum, you may wish to offer one breath. A lung full will net you knowledge of the weather for the next day. In itself, a rather pointless purchase in this age of smartphones and the Met office, but centuries ago, invaluable. Taking this offer will result in the seller reaching out with his hand flattened then quickly grasping it into a fist. The air will literally be stolen from your lungs and cause a few moments of gasping as you catch your breath. Are you attached to your fingers? How attached? I mean, do you reckon you could do without your little finger? This sale will provide you instant forgiveness from any one person you desire for any wrongs you may have encroached against them. Agreeing to this will cause the trader to grin and shout. One Wibsumi special coming right up. They will lunge forward and grab your wrist, pinning it to the table. Don't resist, because no one likes a tough sell. A flash of steel and you will be minus one digit. Just remember, 
you can only pay twice. Now make no mistake, it will hurt. There will probably be a lot of blood. And if you don't take care of the wound, it may even get infected. As the price goes up, you may want to consider taking precautions regarding what you trade. Tourniquets and sutures would certainly not go amiss. Now some of the trades will seem familiar and may hark back to stories and legends that have existed for millennia. This is the influence the market has on our culture, leeching in over the centuries. A pound of flesh will make it impossible for the next person you make a trade with to renege on the deal, especially useful if you don't trust the company you keep. It has no use within the market, as all the traders here are trustworthy and will honor a purchase to the letter in the spirit best to leave this transaction until last. How about one of your eyes? Depth perception is overrated anyway. Offering up one of them will allow you to converse with your avian friends. You'll be able to call down the birds from the trees, and they'll be able to answer any questions you may have. It is advisable that you avoid ravens. They have their own agenda. It's not in your best interest. The salesman will grab you around the throat and slowly press his fingers into the socket. A snap of the wrist and your visual organ will rest in their palm. Another snap, and it will disappear. It's at this point you may want to consider stronger measures to ensure your survival of payment. In this strange little world of ours, the market is hardly the strangest. Artifacts and incantations exist that can allow the body to continue to function long past the point at which mortal coils would be shuffled from. One or two can be picked up here, but few are willing to live without their sexual organs. It seems eternity is that little bit colder without the ability to get your rocks off. Now, I'm not going to go into the details as to how they are taken. Suffice to say that it is unpleasant and messy. At this point, the prices become a little more vital. What would you take for your stomach? In this deal, it would merit you the ability to understand the desires of anyone you talk to. Whilst you converse with them, your mind will be filled with the images of that which they covet the most. This would provide a significant advantage to any budding salesman, and the deal has been taken up by several of the stallholders themselves. Some may argue that such a gift would be more poetically suited to the heart. That vascular muscle, however, is a part of an altogether different deal. By bartering with your heart, you can guarantee the happiness of any given individual for the rest of their life however long that may be. The removal of these type of organs can be significantly painful, but the dealers will allow you a moment to prepare yourself before they produce a short, keen blade. One practice swipe later, and they will be digging into your tissues. They have unerring accuracy and a level of cleanliness that rivals any surgeon. Now, it is acknowledged in some places that once the deal had been sealed, a buyer may have second thoughts, may want to back out. This is not one of those places. Most of the contract is left unspoken, but you are expected to have done your research. The buyout clauses are a killer. While most of the body can be put on the table, there are limitations. The fact of the matter is that the brain is the seat of sentience and cannot be fully placed in. I say, fully. There was one individual who offered to lobotomize the part of the brain that holds memory as part of the deal. The problem is, he cannot remember what he received in return. I hear he suffered night terrors for the rest of his days. Now at this point, I offer a warning. Up until now, I have detailed the price list for your own body parts. Whatever you do, do not attempt to purchase anything in the market with organs of another. Every figure in the market will stop and stare at you, and the one you attempted to defraud will scream, That is not yours to trade.
whatever it is that you have tried to barter with. That body part will be taken from you as punishment. A very literal eye for an eye. Despite whatever theological perspectives you might hold, offering your own soul will elicit the same result. There have been many theories postulated for this response, but the honest answer is, we just don't know. The market has been trading in blood and bone for as long as civilization has existed, though the entrance has moved from city to city. Many have visited and shook hands with the butchers, though not quite as many got those hands back. A smart man would wonder how it is that these individuals are capable of honoring the deals they broker. A smarter man would ask himself why his body parts are such a high value in this economy. Just understand that it is supply and demand. And as long as there are fools willing to supply, you shouldn't need to concern yourself with who is doing the demanding.